Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ed Steinfeld, the director of the Watson Institute. Thank you all for coming today. I see many familiar faces, many friends, and many people who are returning after Ambassador Freeman's first lecture, The Crumbling of the Pax Americana. Uh, I will not take a lot of time to reintroduce Ambassador Chaz Freeman. Last time, I gave you a very brief account of all of his, of his incredible record of service in the United States government, the United States Foreign Service. Uh, if you go to our website, you can read the full uh, biography. But I thought what I would do is just in a sentence or two try to summarize and probably mis-summarize what was said last week in a, ver in a very uh, enlightening and provocative fashion. As I understood it, Ambassador Freeman provided us an account of a world after the Cold War in which American power was absolutely unchallenged. American hegemony was at a height it had never been reached previously. Um, American economic wealth, perhaps, arguably, at a height never before reached. Uh, vast changes in the global order, a very serious, a real threat posed by the Soviet Union had effectively been neutralized. Democratization spread across parts of the world where it, where it hadn't existed for decades previously, if not longer. Um, but at the same time, many challenges emerged very quickly, as Ambassador Freeman also told us about. Some old problems resurfaced, issues of uh, border disputes, some new problems, um, some motivated by extreme ideologies, religious extremism, conflicts between um, different ethnicities. So many problems on that front, as well as uh, some very substantial security threats on the nuclear front, nuclear proliferation, and of course, the attacks of 9-11. And I think what Ambassador Freeman, he'll, he'll correct me, but I think one of the ideas that Ambassador Freeman left us with is that in the face of these very new kinds of security challenges, these very new kinds of challenges to the global order that emerged after the Cold War, the United States, whether intentionally or not, pursued a course with which it increasingly opted to um, engage in coercion or at least the application of military force as opposed to other kinds of, of um, influence or other ways of manifesting power. So that was uh, the global outreach. And that kind of global outreach, outreach, outreach was coupled with a particular set of domestic developments. And Ambassador Freeman characterized those in a number of ways, but I think they boil down to a kind of a political discourse that seemed to be removed from many of the real problems that are faced abroad and many of the real problems faced in the domestic economy, including problems of equity, problems of physical infrastructure. So a political discourse that had gone awry, a general discourse in society that was quite anti-state and anti-government, so hostile to government, hostile to government budgets, but not hostile to one piece of the government budget, and that's the security apparatus, or particularly the military. And in the context of that, the United States began in a very big way, substantial way, to exert force globally in a manner that, rather than resolving many of the problems that Ambassador Freeman um, outlined, exacerbated a number of those problems. And on that less than cheery note, you left us. And on that note, Chaz Freeman, I will reintroduce you and you can help us better understand the situation. That was so much better than what I said that I <laughs> should really get you to come up and do this too. But um, that was great. Thank you. Um, I want to speak to you today uh, about the consequences for our country of changes in the world order. Uh, the United States now has several great power rivals, not one. And it has worse relations with each of these rivals than they have with each other. This is not a situation with which Americans should be comfortable. It's the opposite of world leadership. It reflects America's internal disabilities as well as the disorder that has succeeded both U.S.-Soviet rivalry and the American global hegemony that briefly succeeded that. And it, raise, it raises serious questions about how well Americans understand the international environment 
our country's foreign policy must now navigate. The Cold War is now long over. The winds now blow not from one, but from many directions. But the United States has not changed course, nor have Americans adjusted the alliances or reset the military-dominated approach to foreign policy we developed to deal with Soviet communism. The results of this lapse make it obvious that a rethink is in order. From time to time, the world reorders itself. This is such a time. So was the moment at which the United States was born 240 years ago. <coughs> Tradition has it that a British Army band played the world turned upside down as General Cornwallis surrendered to a combined American and French force at Yorktown in 1781. The French Army and Navy played a decisive role in that surrender, which wouldn't have occurred without them. And it was in Paris, two, two years later, that the British grudgingly accepted the independence of the United States. By the way, that war ended in a negotiation, as all wars should end. And we were successful in negotiating our independence from Britain. Our country's independence was in many ways a byproduct of the global wars that accompanied the world's first bipolar international order. From the outbreak of the Seven Years' War in 1754 until the final defeat of Napoleon in 1815, Britain and France contested world dominance. Not just who would rule in Europe, but also North and South America, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. Had these great powers not balanced each other, either could have snuffed out our republic in its infancy. Had they not been at war, the diplomacy that produced the vast expansion of the Louisiana Purchase could not have taken place. American history began with an illustration that the nature of the world order both creates the context for national security and determines what policies can be successfully pursued within it. Consider the impact on the United States of the French defeat at Waterloo in 1815. This again upended world affairs. It ushered in a century of British manipulation of the European balance of power and British management of the affairs of much of the rest of the globe. Of the, globe. the United States was the world's first, sorry, the United Kingdom was the world's first global military and industrial superpower. Despite misgivings, Britain first accommodated and then facilitated America's rise. The Pax Britannica provided a peaceful international environment in which the United States rose to wealth and power without effective foreign opposition and without the need for much of a foreign policy. Americans may have chafed at British supremacy, but we accepted the benefits of the mostly peaceful world mostly peaceful world order sustained by British imperialism in the Royal Navy. Free of entangling alliances and shielded by the Atlantic and Pacific from great power intervention or the need for our own military engagement in Europe or Asia, Americans practiced diplomatic minimalism. We kept our army and navy small and our defense budgets frugal. We invested in our industry, infrastructure, and workforce, rather than in a military capable of extra-hemispheric adventures. This focus on domestic development enabled us to expand and prosper. By 1875 or so, the American economy was the world's largest. World War I ended the long Pax Britannica, even though the British and other empires remained intact. The American economy emerged from the war larger than those of its next six biggest competitors. But Americans saw no reason that our greater financial clout should make us any more responsible for the maintenance of peace, stability, or prosperity in foreign parts than we had been. We resumed our traditionally aloof stance toward the other side of the Atlantic. Still, some of the ideas we had put forward in our brief wartime appearance on the world stage marched on. <laughs>
Woodrow Wilson's idealistic advocacy of self-determination, which I think had something to do with his identification with the lost cause, uh, but we'll leave that for another discussion. Um, his advocacy of self-determination fragmented Europe, producing, producing weak new states that had little prospect of sustaining themselves against larger neighbors. Germany was humiliated by defeat and impoverished by reparations. Russia was reduced to surly diplomatic isolation. After World War I, neither of these great European powers had any role at all in European governance. Their ostracism left Europe inherently unstable. Europeans lacked both a consensus and a diplomatic structure that could contain national rivalries, revanchism, or the rise of totalitarian ideologies and apparatuses. The United States chose to ignore the dangers of this situation and did nothing to prevent nature from taking its course. Despite America's efforts to keep our distance from the world beyond our oceans, the size of the U.S. economy and the vigor of American society gave us immense financial and cultural influence abroad. We did not use this power intelligently. Our unbending efforts to collect war debt from Europeans ruined by the fighting made their recovery more difficult. When Wall Street crashed in 1929, the United States responded with a series of protectionist measures copied by others. These beggar thy neighbor policies compounded the global financial and economic damage, threw the world into ever deeper depression, and helped catalyze eruptions of militarism in both Europe and Asia. Americans reacted to the return of war to East Asia and Europe with a timidly feckless mixture of denial, righteous indignation, denunciation, and sanctions. Such feel-good diplomacy was largely toothless, but America's size and potential caused it to be seen as life-threatening in Tokyo and menacing in Berlin. The Japanese and Germans acted accordingly. The regional conflicts they had initiated soon expanded to include the United States. Tokyo's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor aimed to deprive America of the capacity to interfere with its empire-building activities in China or its takeover of European colonies in Southeast Asia. But instead of sidelining the United States, Japan's sinking of much of the U.S. Pacific fleet and the seizure of the Philippines galvanized an American drive to destroy Japanese power. The Second World War ended by replacing European and Japanese hegemony in the Western Pacific with that of the United States, dividing Europe into U.S. and Soviet-dominated zones and placing China under strong central government aligned with the USSR. The British, French, and other European empires in Asia and Africa began to disintegrate. As European colonists came home, natives of their colonies followed them. The colonizers began themselves to be colonized. The tension inherent in the struggle of colonial peoples to achieve self-determination took root in former imperial powers, where it is now flowered into terrorism. War had once again rearranged the global geopolitical geometry. This time, the United States could not ignore the challenges the new world order posed. It rose to meet them. World War II devastated Japan, Europe, the Soviet Union, and China, but it left the American homeland unscathed, and it lifted the United States out of economic depression. The United States alone possessed and had used nuclear weapons. American international supremacy, not just military, but economic and financial, political, cultural, and moral, was undeniable. The more than 6,000 ships in the U.S. Navy at the end of World War II gave America an effective naval mono global monopoly on naval power. By the time the war ended, the American economy accounted for half or more of global output. Americans seem to have all the money and most of the answers. The United States enshrined the dollar at the center of a new global monetary system that exempted America from most of the financial disciplines 
that other countries, to which other countries were subject. The United States embodied American ideas, the United Nations embodied American ideas for great power collaboration that could manage world affairs. The almost immediate emergence of a US Soviet contest for supremacy in Europe erased any hope that the vanquishers of, vanquishers of fascism and militarism uh, could jointly manage world affairs through the UN. The, the Cold War divided the planet and established a bipolar world order, the likes of which had not been seen since the Anglo-French contest for global dominance in which our nation was born. As had been the case in the Napoleonic Wars, America's rivalry with the USSR mixed ideology and geopolitics, pitting capitalism and constitutional democracy against economic statism and totalitarian dictatorship. The United States responded to the new world order by transforming itself, its approach to foreign policy, and the way its government was organized. Americans abandoned our 160-year-old aversion to entangling alliances. The United States extended formal defense commitments to over two dozen countries on three continents. It adopted a grand strategy of containment of the communist bloc. The purpose of containment was to wall off the Soviet system and give it time to die of its own deformities. The first alliances in American history established the perimeters of a new U.S. sphere of influence from which we sought to exclude the USSR and its subordinate states, denying them access to trade and investment, as well as human and natural resources. US allies furnished bases and served as mili military auxiliaries at the margins of this American defended sphere, which we called, somewhat inaccurately, the free world. To secure it against Soviet inroads, the United States jump-started European recovery, helped reindustrialize Japan, and launched the visionary reform and opening of world trade and investment that culminated decades later in, in globalization. Washington needed a new national security structure to, to coordinate the policies and programs of this unprecedented American activism in foreign affairs. The United States created an all-service Department of Defense, as well as foreign intelligence, propaganda, and aid agencies. As the Cold War proceeded and Americans became accustomed to life under threat in a permanently declared state of emergency, the role of the military and intelligence services in American foreign policy steadily expanded. The size and political influence of what President Eisenhower named the military industrial congressional complex grew apace. The United States abandoned the concept of a citizen army and built an impressively professional military establishment. It nurtured the growth of huge corporations dependent on federal outlays for their research, development, and production of armaments. It funded the development of new foreign policy-related academic disciplines and established university departments and think tanks to research how to apply these disciplines. U.S. defense budgets and the American military-industrial complex came to dwarf military spending and armaments production by all of America's allies and enemies combined. The budgets of US, defense, U.S. intelligence agencies grew to many, many times that of the Department of State. Diplomats gave way to employees of other agencies as the largest component of America's civilian presence overseas. And then, 25 years ago, the USSR suddenly gave up its drive for global dominance and abolished itself. The threat environment that America's policy-making apparatus, military force structure, weaponry, alliances, spies, and diplomatic representation abroad had all been designed to address suddenly disappeared. No great enemy or ideological challenge appeared to replace Soviet communism as the existential threat to the United States. This was a fundamental change in the world order, comp comparable to that which had galvanized America's self-transformation as the Cold War began. But the Soviet threat had gone away, and there wasn't an obvious new one. Under these circumstances, few Americans thought there was a compelling need to retool 
to address the more complex realities of a world in which we had no ideological or geopolitical rival. We felt no urgent need to change course, so we didn't. Instead, Americans sought to cure our enemy deprivation syndrome <laughs> through a leisurely search for a credible adversary to replace the USSR. We failed to find one. Still, the United States did not trim its alliance structure to reflect the absence of a direct, still less an existential threat to either our global ascendancy or our homeland. Quite the contrary. Because there was nothing to stop us from doing so, we expanded our alliances to fill the political military space the Soviet default on the Cold War had made available. Over the past quarter century, during, over the past quarter century, in the absence of any identifiable military threat to Europe, NATO has grown from 16 to 28, soon to be 29 members. And the United States has now extended America's defense responsibilities right up to the borders of both Russia and China while claiming the unilateral right to keep order in all the territories and seas beyond those borders. In the process, the United States has aligned itself with every country that has a border dispute with either Russia or China. Americans are now, Americans are now the self-proclaimed protectors of Georgia and Ukraine from their Russian neighbor. We are in the process of develop, developing a commitment to protect Vietnam from China, this time all of it, not just the southern part, <laughs> despite the fact that the United States has not won a war so far this century, Americans seem willing to bet our future on the proposition that no bluff we make will ever be called. Or perhaps we really are prepared to go to war with nuclear armed adversaries over constitutional arrangements in culturally schizophrenic Ukraine. Or who can perch where on the un un uninhabitable rocks and reefs of the East and South China Seas. The expanded defense commitments, oh, sorry, the expanded defense commitments we have undertaken do not reflect considered national judgments on the part of the American people. They are not anchored in our Constitution. They are the product of ingrained habit, institutional inertia, hubris, and blindness within the beltway to the realities of a changed world order. The extent to which the American people will back these commitments is uncertain. The foreign pushback to them is not. The international environment the United States must cope with is no longer defined by a life and death struggle with, between would-be hegemons, but by tugs of war between shifting combinations of great powers and regional actors. But we Americans invested a lot in the Cold War bureaucracies, systems, intellectual superstructures, and alliances designed to manage bipolarity. These institutions have no interest in going out of business. They have become what our military colleagues call self-licking ice cream cones. <laughs> this makes it unthinkable to ask what their purpose now is. And we have a military industrial base, after all, to sustain and jobs in the defense sector to protect. So the political path of least resistance has clearly been to keep doing what seemed to work during the Cold War, and that's what we've done. But this is a little like continuing to play checkers when the game has changed to chess. The old rules, those that went by, that we went by in the Cold War, no longer apply, and the old moves no longer work. Our failure to recognize this is having increasingly serious consequences. The Soviet stand down from the contest to dominate the world left the United States as the sole superpower. The clash between constitutional democracy and messianic totalitarianism ended. So did the contest between free market capitalism and statism. The world became safe for political and ideological diversity. Apprehensions about nuclear war just dis virtually disappeared. Superpower proxy wars in the third world went away. But at the same time, the Cold War's constraints on less powerful nations and peoples also disappeared. 
the world changed and its rules of engagement changed within it. No longer constrained by its Soviet patron, Iraq inaugurated the post-Cold War era by invading and annexing Kuwait. In reprisal for Western and Western-backed Israeli intrusions in the Arab world, Islamist extremists, accountable to no power but themselves, bombed New York and the American embassies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. On September 11, 2001, they began a series of spectacular terrorist assaults in New York, Washington, and other Western capitals. They assisted secessionist movements in similar massacres in Russia and then in China. They made it clear that they considered these attacks to be retaliation for past wars against Muslims and the ongoing persecution of Muslim minorities in Palestine, Europe, Russia, and elsewhere. During the Cold War, the possibility of nuclear Armageddon gave the United States and the Soviet Union a common interest in restraining our respective allies or client states. Neither of us wanted a state within our sphere to provoke the other by attacking its homeland. When wars occurred, we sought to keep them limited or to avoid their widening or escalating into direct combat between the US and Soviet armed forces. Intervention in the nations of the third world therefore entailed little apparent risk to either the American or Soviet homeland. In the bipolar order of the past, neither the Soviet Union nor China would allow North Korea or Vietnam to retaliate against the United States by attacking targets in America. The United States might fight thinly disguised Chinese forces in Korea and Vietnam, but the Chinese could be confident that America would not take its war to the Chinese homeland. The US knew China would not attack America. The Soviets could be sure the, that the Afghan Mujahideen CIA and Chinese handlers would discourage them from going after targets in the USSR. The United States could bomb Tripoli while relying on the Soviets to deter Libyan reprisal against the American homeland and so forth. All this has changed. Now when a great power bombs a foreign people, there is no other great power to deter that people from finding a way to bomb back. Hence 9-11. In the globalized world in which we now live, Americans must expect military interventions in other lands to generate opposite, if not immediate or symmetrical responses and reactions against us. We are both more powerful and more vulnerable to reprisal, if only pinprick, than at any previous period in our history. And we need to take this into account when we use force overseas. In the new circumstances, the argument that Americans must fight terrorists over there to avoid having to fight them here is dangerously wrong. We are learning the hard way that the more we poke hornets' nests abroad, the more likely hornets are to sting us here in our homeland. Drone warfare is proving counterproductive. Killing Muslims overseas while projecting an image of an America that hates and represses Islam at home is just what is required to inspire anti-American extremists with global reach and self-starting American copycats. The greater likelihood of retaliation against us by non-state actors, including deranged individuals with guns or improvised explosive devices, is of course far from the only important change in the international environment to which the United States has yet to craft an effective response. Global dynamics increasingly reflect the emergence of non-Western forms of modernity and the diffusion of power to the world's regions. Major realignments and shifts in regional balances of power are also taking place. Americans are not coping at all well with a world in which we no longer call the shots. As the 20, 21st century begin, began, misguided US attempts at regime change in West Asia and North Africa overthrew the state system imposed by European colonialism, destabilized previously tranquil societies, and ignited sectarian conflict, ethnic cleansing, and civil wars. The region is now being reshaped by sectarianism, widening proxy wars between Iran, Saudi Arabia, and other Gulf Arabs, eruptions of Jewish and Muslim extremism, and violent disagreements among Muslims about how to restore their civilization 
to greatness. None of these countries or causes can now be restrained by great powers outside the region. The United States and other outside powers whose interventions helped <laughs> kindle this strife have been powerless to inhibit, let alone halt it. U.S. relations with all the, the major actors in the region, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, are ever more distrustful and strained. Rebuilding these relationships is the prerequisite for implementing a strategy, if Americans can devise one, to defend and advance U.S. interests in the region. But even then, progress will depend on the region's major powers agreeing a peace among themselves. The United States may or may not be part of such a process. The spreading violence is an existential threat only to the states and peoples in the region where it originates, but it is having painful worldwide spillover effects. Neither Russia nor uh, Europe has been able to insulate itself. The mayhem is now touching the United States and uh, countries in East and South Asia. There is no coherent international plan for containing the threat of Islamist terrorism. None. In many respects, American, Russian, European, and Chinese pol policies and actions seem, in fact, to be exacerbating the phenomenon. Instead of making common cause with mainstream Muslims to combat Islamist extremists, the United States is alienating itself from the Muslim world. Obvious opportunities for diplomatic cooperation remain unexplored and unexploited. Uncontrollable flows of refugees escaping war and poverty in West Asia, North Africa, and the Sahel now threaten the unity of the European Union, which was already under stress from economic stagnation and persistently high unemployment. The EU's economic problems have exacerbated racial and religious tensions between Europeans and immigrants from their former colonies. The result is belated blowback from imperialism in the form of Islamist extremism and terrorism. This has given some of the EU's newer member states excuses to pursue autocratic and nationalist agendas that further threaten the continent's hard-won hard political and cultural cohesion. Divisions between Europe's prosperous North and its indebted South, its liberal West and autocratic East, its German-dominated Euroland, and areas with national currencies are more acute than ever. The EU has proved unable to coordinate the fiscal policies of its members. It's had to rely on monetary policy instead. But few now believe that monetary policy alone can end your economic malaise in Europe, or for that matter, in America, where we have exactly the same phenomenon due to government dysfunction. Europeans are increasingly despondent. Europe demands attention from the United States. It's not just that Europe and America are part of a single geostrategic zone and, are pre and, and a previously dominant global civilization. The European economy remains the world's largest. Sustaining the worldwide influence of Western values in the face of competition from non-Western traditions requires preserving transatlantic consensus. Americans share Europeans' frustrations with dysfunctional government, we can and should learn from each other as we work to mend our broken politics. Europe's political, economic, and ideological fault lines were for long the major source of global conflict. On at least four occasions, these divisions have convulsed the world in planet-wide warfare. This is an important reason that European unity has long been as much an American as a European project. If Europe disintegrates, so will transatlantic ties. But European enthusiasm for the EU has flagged. The EU has been unable to develop coherent responses to any of the political and economic crises it now faces. Popular dissatisfaction with both the shortcomings of EU governance and its bureaucratism has grown. As the British referendum on whether to leave the EU illustrates there's now a serious risk that Europe will come apart. Meanwhile, in a classic instance of moral hazard, 
the willingness of the United States to supply military muscle for Europe through NATO continues to relieve Europeans of the need to pay and provide for their own defense. Europe's failure to come together as an effective political and, economic and military partner for the United States has in turn reduced American interest in the European project. At the same time, Europeans see the United States as too prone to pursue military solutions to essentially political problems. Europeans and Americans are slowly falling out on matters of great concern to both. The Ukraine, Ukraine imbroglio is a case in point. To be stable, independent, and prosperous, Ukraine requires cooperative relations with both the EU and Russia. Western Europeans, led by Germany, seek to restore a relationship between the EU, EU and Russia within which Ukraine can find such balance while healing its internal divisions and evolving a coherent national identity. identity uh, much like the neutralization of Austria at the height of the Cold War in 1956 in the Austrian State Treaty. Americans and some Eastern Europeans see containing Russian influence in Ukraine and fortifying the EU's borders with Russia as the main tasks before us. EU efforts to renew diplomatic dialogue and rebuild trust with Russia contradict the US preference for military capacity building in Ukraine and escalating pressure to punish Russian adventurism. <coughs> These differing approaches test transatlantic unity. They leave Ukraine's identity crisis uncured and Russia's long-term relationship with Europe unaddressed. The result is a protracted crisis that calls into question both Ukraine's viability as a nation and its potential as both a buffer state and a bridge between Russia and the rest of Europe. In this stalemate, all lose. The impasse in Ukraine inhibits desirable cooperation between Europe, Russia, and the United States on other issues. It contributes to the current drift toward more distant U.S.-European relations. Like Germany, after World War I, Russia is left with no stake in the European order. And Americans and Russians are once again engaged in contingency planning for a possible war between us at the nuclear level. U.S.-led efforts to isolate Russia have also strengthened its impulse to make common cause with China. Both Beijing and Moscow seek to counter what they see as U.S. policies that disrespect their interests and those of other independent states. Ironically, in view of the historic disdain of both these countries for the rule of law, this has driven them to emphasize support for international law, the procedures of the United Nations and the principles of the Westphalian order. They base their opposition to U.S.-backed military interventions like those in Libya, Syria, or Yemen on the principles of the U.N. Charter. Meanwhile, Russia cites NATO's forceful separation of Kosovo from Serbia without U.N. authorization as an exculpatory precedent for its own less violent but equally unauthorized separation of Crimea from Ukraine. Russia is a great regional power that borders Europe, the Middle East, China, and Japan, and has intercontinental nuclear reach. It plays a major role in global energy and arms markets. The U.S. attempt to punish Russian adventurism in Ukraine by ostracizing Moscow has inadvertently revealed how important the Russians are as players on issues of importance to the United States. Without Russian cooperation or acquiescence, it is hard to imagine any success in the management of affairs in Europe, the Middle East, post-NATO Afghanistan, or the Arctic. Demonizing and dissing Russia's leader is puerile posturing, not a policy. In the, po in the new world disorder, adversaries on some issues are indispensable allies on others. The notion that you are either with us or against us is an unsophisticated delusion of Bush League minds. U.S.-Russian intervention and interaction, U.S.-Russian interaction over Syria, where we are adversaries, has illustrated this on several occasions. Russia's now six-month-old military intervention in Syria has altered more than the correlation of forces on the ground. It has underscored the need for a peace process in Syria and begun to make one possible 
that has made Russia a significant actor in the international campaign against Islamist extremism and an essential part of any effort to staunch the flow of refugees that now threatens the EU. In response, without announcing a policy change, Washington has re-engaged with Moscow. Wisdom is to be welcomed, even when delayed. Dismissing Russia as a has-been power has been a mistake. The question Americans must now dare to address is how to secure Russian cooperation where we have common interests, even as we oppose our, each other where our interests conflict. <coughs> U.S. policies are currently pushing Russia toward China, whose rise was already rebalancing relationships across the Eurasian landmass on its periphery and in the world as a whole. China's GDP has quintupled since 1990. It's on a course to surpass that of the United States. China's begun to play an active role in reshaping the post-war international economic order, which it views as skewed in favor of American, European, and Japanese interests. By 2020, the Chinese are expected to have invested $20 trillion abroad. At, as the inauguration of institutions like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the so-called BRICS Bank illustrate, China is now a significant force in global governance. It has become a rule maker, not just a rule taker. The economic order in the Indo-Pacific is now Sino-centric. This reality is not going to be changed by the bravado around which the Obama administration has built its domestic political case for approval of TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. China cannot be excluded from writing a major part of the rules in a region where it is, in every, where it is everybody's largest trading partner and source of new investment. India and Japan, the Indo-Pacific's other great powers, also will have much to say about what the rules are, as will ASEAN. They are reacting to China's growing military power by beginning to cooperate to offset it. This is causing them to strengthen their relations with the United States and with each other. China is their greatest security concern, but China is also, and is likely to remain, their largest economic partner. In military terms, China is not yet an irresistible force, but it has become an immovable object. An enhanced access to Russian and European science, technology, and armament is now strengthening China's modernization, including its military modernization. But this just adds to China's increasingly formidable capabilities for innovation. By 2025, it is expected to have, China is expected alone, to have a larger scientific, technological, engineering, and mathematical workforce than all member countries of the OECD combined. This underscores the need to recognize and respond to China's growing role, not just in East Asia, but in a wider arena. China's One Belt, One Road pro proposal is by far the largest integrated infrastructure project in human history. It's aim it aims to connect every part of the Eurasian landmass to every other and to ensure that all roads, railroads, and other links in this vast space lead to Beijing, placing China at its center. This is a plan to erase borders to every kind of human interaction from Portugal to the Pacific. It is an effort to integrate the major part of the planet by commercial confederation rather than military conquest. It requires a non-military response. As the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank debacle uh, demonstrated, on many issues, American allies, partners, and friends now see their interests as dictating support for Chinese positions rather than ours. This is a further illustration of the absence of fixity in international relationships and the increasing fluidity of the new world disorder. A world, a, a country with which we collaborate on one difference with a third country may very well be our opponent on another issue involving that very same country. Americans need to cultivate the emotional detachment and master the diplomatic agility required to cope with these complexities. In the protracted struggle between two sides, that was the Cold War. The primary task of both American diplomacy and military planning was the prevention of change 
in the bipolar status quo, not the resolution of problems or the achievement of favorable adjustments between the two sides. The United States specialized in the military deterrence of change, not problem solving through diplomacy. U.S. diplomacy came to resemble trench warfare. Its purpose was to hold the line while occasionally probing the other side's defenses, <coughs> to recognize that breakthroughs by our side were impossible, and to ensure that they were equally impossible for the other side. We have left that world behind. The rigid system of alliances we built to forestall change in the borders between now vanished spheres of influence needs zero-based re-examination. Policies directed at managing potential conflict through military deterrence rather than attempting to eliminate the causes of such conflict through negotiations also need re-examination. Deterrence does not remove the risk that differences between nations will degenerate into armed conflict so much as to delay such conflict. It contains but perpetuates the danger of war. During the Cold War, almost every issue was a zero-sum game in which one superpower's advance was seen as the other's retreat. Given the desire of both superpowers to prevent local disputes from spiraling, spiraling into combat and possible nuclear war between us, it made sense to respond to almost all challenges by freezing them. The most effective way to do that was by issuing threats that showed willingness to risk escalation. But with the Cold War behind us, such military deterrence to block change rather than diplomacy aimed at reducing or ending the danger of war is proving counterproductive. There is no free world with borders whose ramparts Americans must now man. There is no longer a global zero-sum game between competing ideological camps or spheres of influence. We can afford to try to solve problems rather than so storing up trouble by letting them fester. We have no need to preserve our credibility as the defenders of the status quo against a now non-existent adversary. In the new circumstances, adjustments in the past state of affairs need not signal loss of American control so much as a demonstration of American power. Instead of reflex reflexively, reflexively deterring such adjustments, we should be thinking about how to turn them to global and regional advantage. For example, it would clearly serve U.S. interests to end the South-North confrontation on the Korean Peninsula, and with it the U.S. troop presence along the 38th parallel that serves as a tripwire against North Korean attack. What happens between South and North Korea is no longer connected to any global contest. And it does not make sense to preserve the status quo until perhaps a decade or more from now a hostile North Korea acquires the ability to conduct a nuclear strike against our homeland, which it will when, unless things change. South Korea now has an economy 35 times that of the North. When I first went there, they were equal. Um, at the, when the Korean War occurred, North Korea had an economy twice as large as South Korea. South Korea is now 35 times larger. A peace treaty between South and North, joined by the United States and China, could end the war, the danger of war in Korea. So, of course, would an implosion of the despicable North Korean regime. Either outcome should be acceptable to Americans. But a negotiated end to the military standoff on the peninsula would surely be preferable to the violent uncertainties of turmoil in the North. Americans and South Koreans should focus on what sort of relationship the United States might have with a Korea that is at peace with itself, how to achieve such a Korea, and what kinds of relationships Korea should have with China and Japan. Similarly, a negotiated resolution of the question of Taiwan's relationship to the rest of China would remove a threat to the peace of the Western Pacific and a potential casus belli between China and the United States. The status quo risks an eventual armed clash between competing nationalisms that would devastate Taiwan and adjacent areas of the China mainland while dragging the United States into a war with a nuclear-armed China. It impairs Taiwan's prosperity, 
the, the status quo impairs Taiwan's prosperity by inhibiting its participation in regional trade and investment regimes. The emotions it generates constrain cooperation between China and the United States. U.S. policies posited on sustaining military balance in the Taiwan Strait are unrealistic, infeasible, and counterproductive. Since 1950, the major objective of the United States in the Taiwan area has been to preclude the use of force there. While it's up to Taipei and Beijing to strike a deal that both can live with, it's time for the United States to adopt policies that have the effect of encouraging rather than inhibiting or discouraging them from doing so. For analogous reasons, as I've argued elsewhere, in this room actually, um, rather than deploying the U.S. armed forces to freeze the situation in the East and South China Seas through military deterrence, the United States should be encouraging the parties to settle their disputes through negotiations. As a final example, in the Middle East, Israel's continued viability as an internationally supported democratic Jewish homeland is in mounting jeopardy as Palestinians are transformed into a desperate, desperate people without land. The consequences of the Israel-Palestine conflict for both regional stability and U.S. interests have already been enormous. The potential for cat catastrophe is growing. Enabling the continuation of current trends will end in disaster for the United States, as well as Israel, the Palestinians, and the region. Americans must now use our leverage to impose incentives for Israel to prefer peaceful coexistence with its Arab neighbors and disincentives for it to continue oppressing and displacing Palestinians. The alternative is tragedy. The Pax Americana is no more. America's alliances have lost their original purposes, as have most of our client state relationships. With few exceptions, U.S. allies and protected states are no longer threatened by countries that are also enemies of the United States. Their issues are not those of Americans, and American issues are not theirs. The policies we've inherited on issues like those I've just cited all lead at best to dead ends, and at worst to tragedy. All place short-term considerations ahead of likely long-term consequences. None is clearly succeeding. Some are visibly failing. The issues they present are no longer embedded in zero-sum rivalry on the global level. Their peaceful resolution by the parties would harm no one and benefit many. Despite the political difficulties of changing long-established policies, all merit rethinking. It's time to take the risk to consider how to discourage the parties to such disputes from carrying on as they have and to incentivize them to take their own actions mitigate, settle, or shelve their differences. To sum up, in the new world disorder, America needs national security policies that begin and end by asking what's in these policies for Americans, not what foreign nations long dependent on our protection might think about them. There is no reason for us to continue to shoulder burdens others can now bear. We should build our strength while holding it in reserve. We should act only when it is in our interest to act. If the United States makes itself and the world safer, Americans will be better off. Our credibility, with which we become so obsessed, will take care of itself. Thank you. Sure, I'd be happy to. And you're welcome to, if you want to sit. Uh, um, well, I might, actually. I, I think do you, I have. Would you like to field your own questions, or do you want me to? Uh, uh, well, uh, you go ahead. <laughs> All right, maybe I'll. Any qu Yes. Ambassador Freeman was very impressive uh, presentation last time and this time. It gave a huge overview of where we were and what's it's at stake now, and now we'll have to think ahead. Uh, I have a little bit of difficulty, though, to think in terms of Russia today. For example, I think we overestimated its power during the Cold War, and we're overestimating its positions today. Uh, I think partners have to work on trust base. 
on the things that have been occurring, I don't see that that United States can trust in the process, in the promises, in agreements, in memoranda uh, that Russia is putting on the table. Syria is one example, Ukraine is another example, and what is Russia doing in Europe and another. So I think uh, it is wonderful to see this large overview because we have to have a big picture before we uh, uh, approach any singular, uh, uh, single problem. But I think the issue is how do we assure in these uh, 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 negotiations and work uh, uh, with, with them that we are not taken uh, advantage of? Thank you. Well, I think that's a very essential issue. Um, Russia's obviously got loads of problems. Um, in Russia, uh, one, the top 1% 1 of the population now has 78% of the wealth, which makes our income inequality look trivial. Um, it is not an attractive regime. In many ways, it is a protection racket pretending to be a government. Um, we know about that in Providence, Rhode Island, I think. Um, <laughs> um, the, um, uh, and surely there's no reason, I don't frankly believe in trusting any foreign government beyond what its own interests dictate. That includes allies. Um, I haven't seen much evidence in history of willingness on the part of others to sacrifice themselves out of a misguided sense of loyalty. Um, so I take it for granted that the Russians can be bound only by um, a web of interests that is, makes settlements to their advantage. Uh, I think I cited the Austrian State Treaty of 1956 uh, as an example precisely for that reason. That was the height of the Cold War. Austria was then occupied by four powers, one of which was the Soviet Union. Uh, the other three were the United States, Britain, and France. Uh, it was not an independent state, and it had no apparent future. And yet we worked out a treaty which allowed Austria to become neutral, independent, prosperous, and which required Austria, by the way, to deal fairly with its Italian and Slovene minority populations. If we could do that at the height of the Cold War, we can deal with the less dangerous situation now. The biggest concern I have about Russia really is a, is a big picture concern. And it goes right back to what happened after World War I, when Europe was left with no buy-in to the existing order, the post-World War I order, by two great powers, Germany and the Soviet Union an inherently unstable situation. I think we are building an inherently in unstable situation in Europe by not finding a way to incorporate Russia into the security architecture. Um, I, don't, I don't see any path to self-determination for Ukraine or prosperity in Ukraine um, except by Ukraine having a position between, uh, West and, 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 and between the West and, and Russia. Um, and taking time to resolve its internal identity problems, which are acute. Um, so uh, I would say, I guess my answer to you in a sense is that of a professional diplomat. Um, uh, uh, dip optimism is to diplomats what courage is to soldiers. Um, you, you have to have it or you won't charge the hill or you can't get up in the morning and go and try to accomplish something. And I don't see this as insoluble at all. Difficult, yes. Um, not easy, but not impossible. Can you turn off the slide so we don't? I see Patrick's head on the slide. Oh, okay. But okay. Right. Who, who have I got in? On what part of the world do I have on my? <laughs> Thank you. I want to thank you, Chaz. This sounds like a tutorial for the uh, presidential candidates, I hope. So it's a heavy dose of realism as well. Uh, just, uh, you used a phrase uh, which I think is important, especially an integral part of uh, diplomacy, which is you don't disrespect the interests of others. Uh, think about China and Russia. Is promoting democracy and human rights showing disrespect for their interests? And what role do you see uh, in, in that sort of normative 
part of our ideology as a nation as part of our foreign policy? Well, I have to say that um, my own strong preference aligns with that of John Quincy Adams, uh, that the United States is best able to lead internationally to assist the independence and democratization of others by perfecting our own democracy at home. Uh, you referred to the, the current presidential campaign, um, which is, you know, any addition on the foreign policy side would be a plus because so far there has been no foreign policy discussion. There's been a lot of posturing, growling, and, and essentially uh, demonstrations of, of, of a degree of ignorance um, that uh, is quite frightening. Um, you know, when the British Parliament has to debate the question whether the leading presidential candidate of the Republican Party should be banned from entry to Britain, uh, we have a problem. Um, so um, uh, I think one issue uh, underlying everything that I'm saying is um, that there's a requirement for much greater literacy on the part of the American public about diplomacy, uh, about alternatives to the use of force as a means of resolving international issues. Uh, this is not taught in our schools. Uh, nobody has any idea what diplomats do. Um, the late General Vernon Walters once said that, that basically um, the military and diplomats resemble each other uh, because um, they both act with utter confusion and disarray, uh, but the, the soldiers get up early in the morning and do it then, and the diplomats wait till the afternoon and do it over cocktails. But um, I think uh, there is more distinction between the two than that, and, and we don't, as a people, have, have that. Should we promote democracy uh, and human rights? We should be the friend of anyone abroad who is struggling for either. Um, but it is not for us to tell people what kind of government they have. And their legi the legitimacy of their government is not determined by what foreigners think of it. It is determined by the consent of the governed. Uh, if you have a government like the one in Egypt at the moment, which is systematically destroying the consent of the govern governed, then you might well think twice about aligning yourself as closely with that government as we do. But that's a matter of self-interest. Uh, we can't pre compel the Egyptians um, to emulate our better moments, uh, which are not always either. Maybe one or two more questions. Yes, Ms. Sutton. Um, what part do you see um, uh, things like hunger and dwindling resources and the fifth hearth horseman of uh, climate change as both as a possibility of focusing our attention on a common enemy um, and um, uh, determining policy going forth? Um, well, these are conditions which are certain to make um, uh, life on the planet more, uh, more difficult, more, con more violent. Um, uh, I think the Defense Department quite sincerely recognizes those as national security threats. I say quite sincerely because the normal ploy in Washington, if you can't generate enthusiasm for something, is to make it into a national security issue. Uh, which is fraud, but this in, in this case, I think they're quite serious. Um, you think about the implications for a country like Bangladesh of sea level rise, uh, and uh, where are 200 million people going to go, uh, and you realize how terribly disruptive some of the changes that we've set in motion are. But I would say that the biggest problem we confront in those instances is nicely illustrated by the Supreme Court's stay order on um, coal-fired power plants. There is a serious constitutional issue there. Uh, that is not to be disputed. But internationally, what that shows, that dramatizes the reason that the Conference at Paris was not able to come up with a treaty. It couldn't have a treaty because we knew we couldn't ratify a treaty. So whatever was done in Paris had to be non-binding under international law. That, that was our requirement. And that, frankly, is a very sad commentary on the state of affairs in this country. Uh, and uh, one hopes that at some point it will be corrected, although I don't see any sign of it at the moment. 
time for one last question. Yes. Yeah. Where do you see or uh, the impulse for more investment in diplomacy coming from? Uh, I mean, I just read in the Times about Obama committing billions to sending more troops to, you know, our you know, Eastern Europe and, and with the prospect of a Republican, you know, winning the White House and ignoramus on foreign policy or warmonger or whatever. I, I completely agree with you. We need to invest more in diplomacy. But where's that impulse? Where's it going to come from? It will come the same way that mules learn to behave. Uh, someone will hit us in the head with a two by four. Uh, there will be a debacle of some sort, and we will have a rare moment of national reflection. Um, and uh, it won't happen before that. Uh, because uh, for all the reasons that I described last Thursday, uh, the uh, military industrial complex and the habits of militarism are now so deeply ingrained and so much in the interest of so many uh, economic and political interests in the United States that uh, nothing is going to counter them until there is uh, a moment of national reflection. What kind of debacle might accomplish Well, that? we had one on 9-11. Uh, I rather hoped for a moment that that might cause some reflection. Instead, it caused an outburst of self-righteousness. Um, they hate us for who we are and what we believe, which is total nonsense. Uh, it couldn't have anything to do with what we do, um, could it? And, in, and, when, and when someone had the temerity, I think Al-Walid bin Talal, the wealthy Saudi prince, gave $10 million to New York uh, as part of a contribution to rehabilitation, and said he hoped Americans would reflect on the reasons for 9-11, that money was angrily refused by uh, Mayor Giuliani. Um, so um, I think um, disaster doesn't always lead to reflection. Sometimes it leads uh, simply to rage uh, and uh, the absence of reflection. But I, uh, I'd, frankly, I would love to see uh, someone in the uh, presidential sweepstakes, other than Rand Paul, who began to get into some of this, raise these issues. Um, so far, what I've seen is a cavalcade of clowns, um, not even very funny, uh, actually, um, and, uh, and, and not any net addition to national understanding of serious issues. Uh, I could list you know, 15 issues everybody in this room would agree are serious issues in front of us, whether they're physical infrastructure or, or human infrastructure and investment in education uh, or science and technology, research and development, uh, or the various issues this gentleman raised uh, about uh, climate change, environment, and uh, so forth, uh, and not one of those is being discussed, not one, which is quite amazing. Jazz, you know, the term uh, tutorial was raised, and I have to say, I will speak for myself, but I think I can also speak for everybody that today we have received a tutorial. My, my sons are fond of telling me, with regard to many issues, that they have schooled me. It's like, schooled me in this, schooled me in that. Chaz, you have, you have schooled us. I feel like that mule that's been hit by the two by four with the geopolitical reality that you've given us. But I thank you, and I invite you all to come to the third lecture, Recovering Diplomatic Agility. Thanks. Thank you.